um, a statistician. She's also a research engineer, and she's an advocate of open and reproducible science. Um, she obtained her PhD at the University of Zurich, and she now uh, is working as a group leader uh, in uh, open artificial intelligence in health at the Helmholtz Artificial Intelligence Institute in Munich, Germany. And she's uh, working at the intersection between machine learning, artificial intelligence, and, and health. And she's um, willing, and she's also very supportive of other scientists to help them to uh, migrate towards more open and reproducible science practices. So uh, for us, it's obviously been a great a privilege and pleasure to have Heidi talking uh, about this, uh, her, 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 um, her experience in open data science with us. And thanks a lot, Heidi, for, for being here. And whenever you like, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks uh, for having me. So unfortunately, you can't see me today because uh, also in Germany, we sometimes have internet connection issues, <laughs> um, which we are having today at our home. Um, so I'm connected using my phone, and I think I I hope that the audio is good enough and that you can still follow me. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, today I want to talk about uh, the topic open data science. So what does that mean? Um, how does open science and data science connect? And why should we um, think about becoming um, open data scientists? Um, next slide, please. So um, I usually try to have people ask many questions. And since we're in this online setting, I would like you to ask your question in uh, this pad that I linked here at the bottom. So um, if you can enter um, this link in your browser, then you will see a window opening. And I hope that my internet connection is good enough to read that. Otherwise, I will ask uh, someone from, yeah, from the audience to unmute and help me with the questions as well. Um, but yeah, if you can open this link, then there will be a possibility for you to ask questions. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom, it says um, questions, and you can add your questions there in case you have any. And we'll try to discuss them at the end or maybe also in between. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, first of all, who am I? Why do I talk about this topic? Uh, why am I knowledgeable about this at all? Um, yeah, so uh, from my background, as uh, Enzo said, I'm a statistician. So I studied uh, statistics in my bachelor's and master's and then went on to do my PhD in uh, computational biostatistics. I'm considering myself not only a statistician, but also a data scientist. It's not that big of a difference, but I'm since I'm working more like in the computational fields and also on machine learning methods, um, this is what, more what, as what I, I self-identify. I'm also a research software engineer. That means I'm writing um, R packages and software tools for other researchers. Um, yeah, and so I already said that I'm a group lead at, the, at uh, Helmholtz in, in OpenAI. And uh, finally, I'm also an advocate for open science. So let's get started. What is open science, actually? What do, what do we mean by that? Um, and I, I really like this little image here because it shows different perspectives of what open science actually means. So open science is transparent science. So science that you can look into, that you can actually understand what people um, are doing in their actual science. So that goes beyond just reading the paper. It goes more also into things like reading the code, looking at the data, looking at, um, I don't know, uh, lab reports or whatever field you're looking at, right? Um, and then this also um, directly evolves into accessibility. So um, also others should be able to understand and access the things that you have. It should be um, available online and it should be free because most of us as researchers were paid by the taxpayer. And I ge genuinely believe that if you're paid by the taxpayer, then the taxpayer should also have access to it. And beyond that, it's only the best for science if all the other scientists have also access to all the science that I'm doing. 
And finally, it should also be reusable to make science as good as it can be, because if we can reuse other science, then we're doing science the way it should be, because nobody starts with their scientific work um, like at the bottom uh, without any prior knowledge, but we're all building on uh, the shoulder of giants and um, making our work reusable makes it possible for others to build on our shoulders as well. Next slide, please. So what does this have to do with data science? Let's start with um, thinking about what data science actually means and what is actually the process of like data science wor work. And I brought here this image with the data science building blocks. So first of all, in a data science project, we're acquiring some data, then we're cleaning the data, we're exploring it a little bit, we're pre-processing so that we can model it. Um, and finally, in the end, when we have a model that we're happy with or some other product that we're happy with, then we want to validate um, our results and finally present our results, may it be using, via talk or a paper or any other medium like a dashboard, for example. Next slide, please. So what does this have to do with open science? Well, all of these building blocks contain things that um, are relevant for open science, or in this case, then open data science. So when we speak about data, for example, we want to speak about open data. When we speak about the analysis, we're using code, so we want to talk about open source code. Um, finally, when we present our results, we're, we can talk about open access to these uh, results to, for example, the paper. And then potentially there's many other things that are involved there, which I'm here summarizing using the term open materials. Next slide, please. So why do we want all that? Why do we want open data? Why want, do we want open source code? Why do we want to make um, all of these things open? Why do we want to be open scientists? Well, um, first of all, we want to increase the trust in science. So as I said before, most of us are paid by the taxpayer, and even if we're not, we want people out there to um, yeah, read what we're doing and to also trust in the science that we do. Um, finally, we also don't want to waste public resources. Uh, a really cool thing about um, open science is also that you can get feedback and you can also get really good feedback. So every once in a while, someone tells me, hey, you have a bug in your code, you did something wrong there. And of course, they're sometimes even <laughs> correct because nobody's perfect. And that will improve my science. Um, and it has been improving my science tremendously. So this is one of the really cool things about open science as well. Um, being international and inclusive is also one reason why I think open science is, um, is super nice, because if we make our um, work uh, openly available, then anyone can build on it, use it, or collaborate with us. So, and these connections, they don't just happen, right? If I want to work with some, someone um, that I don't know, I will probably not know how what what they're doing. But if I um, see some someone's work and I can follow what they're doing and I can maybe even work with their data, then it's much more likely that I'll collaborate with them. And finally, of course, what I already said before, also um, increasing the speed of discovery. Right? We're, we've all gotten into science to like do something to improve the world, or maybe you're thinking about getting into science. Um, and for many of us, the reason why we want to be scientists is to do something good in the world, to make uh, new knowledge in a way. And speed is an important part here, right? Because we don't want to redo something that someone else already did, but we want to uh, create something new, and that we can only do if we can build upon what others have already done. The slide itself is also an example for why open science is really cool, because I didn't make the slide. I actually took the slide from the LMU Open Science Center, and I didn't have to create it. It saved um, some time for me, and I get a really nice slide with 
uh, really nice little images in there. Okay, next slide. Um, what is the reason, um, like what happens if we, we don't do open science? And I think what, we're see, what we've been seeing the last like 10, 15 years um, what we call the reproducibility crisis, is one thing that happens if um, people or scientists are more focused on like, improving their career and having really cool papers in, in, I don't know, nature or science, rather than focusing on good quality science, open science, and um, building upon each other's work. Um, and this is something that actually nobody really wants, right? Nobody wants... Um, science to be non-reproducible. What does reproducibility actually mean? So it means that we can um, redo what others have done and get the same results. And the reproducibility crisis has shown us that um, this doesn't necessarily always work, right? So um, <laughs> sometimes, or very often actually, if we d redo something a different scientist has done, um, we don't get the same results. And that's obviously something that we don't want and which has led science into a big, big crisis, especially in the fields of like psychology and medicine. But I'm sure um, you've seen similar discussions also in your field as well. Next slide, please. So um, now let's get to the next question. Like, why wouldn't people do open science? And this, I think, is always a very important question as well, because there's many people who get into science with, like, really the best intentions, and then um, in the end they do research to the best of their knowledge, but maybe it's not open, it's not reproducible even. And um, why do we get there? How do we get there? And what stops us from making our work openly available? And this is something where it, I would like your input as well. And I hope that I, I will also be able to read it. So again, we're going to this link here to this pad. And I would like to see your answers to those questions like, what do you think stops people from making their work openly available? Or what do you think would stop you yourself to make your work openly available? And I see that already some people are writing something here. And um, I think we're quite a lot of people here, so I'm expecting at least 50 answers. <laughs> so it'll take a couple of minutes um, so that you can think, and we'll, I will try to summarize a little bit the answers here. So I can I can perhaps I can perhaps risk I, I I'm not I, I'm not entering the path because I'm sharing the slides. But I can perhaps sorry maybe, what? Sorry, I I I I'm not I can I can't enter the path because I'm sharing the slides. But um, I I think that probably one of the main reasons uh, for physicists at least is um, the fear of sharing code that is poorly written or difficult to understand for computer scientists or for more professional code. So that is kind of a, one of the reasons I think uh, it's very common among physicists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will say something about that in a minute because I yeah. think that's a very, very common fear, actually. Yes, it is. And I see that a lot of people are already writing. And I really encourage everyone to think about it and write something here as well.
I would say like maybe one more minute and then we'll go on. Okay, so thanks a lot to everyone for participating in this little exercise. Um, you'll also see at the top of um, the pad that I linked the slides there. So if you're interested in the slides, you can find them there as well. Um, so you've given a lot of very, very important and good points. And uh, I want to try to answer them like throughout this talk and um, give you a a bit of an idea what you can do about things like um, being scared or um, open access costing a lot. Um, so these are all very valuable um, comments and things that people um, struggle with. Um, I hope that we don't have to answer the question of selfishness. I hope that we, <laughs> we can be good enough scientists to not only think about our own career, but of course, this is also a, a struggle that I personally have is like, how do I improve my career with these things that I'm doing? And so far, I can already say I'm doing pretty well. So let's um, go on and I'll try to um, pick your answers when, when they come up um, in the slides and try to answer them there. So let's go to the next slide. Sorry. Okay, so I want to talk today about like simple steps that we can take towards becoming open scientists, towards becoming real science champions, really. And um, you already mentioned in your comments that it's um, sometimes not very easy. People don't know how to do it. And I want to just say like open, being an, an open scientist is lo not like binary. It's not like either you are an open scientist or you aren't, it's rather a scale and you can take simple steps towards, um, towards the top of the scale, I would say, okay? So this is not something where we have to learn all at once, but there's a couple of things that I think um, we can try one after another. We don't have to learn everything at once. So the first thing that I recommend is talking about open science. Talk about it with your peers, talk about it with um, your thesis supervisors, talk about it with people um, that are interested about uh, in, in open science and see what their opinion is, what they think is um, important. And I've done this a lot and it, each time I do that, it helps me a lot. And I find people who struggle with the same things or have already figured out some things that I haven't. Um, secondly, if you ever get to be a reviewer or if you're already reviewing papers, then it's usually nice because um, you can ask for things, right? So when I get a paper to review, I ask for open material. So I, I say, well, I can't understand the paper if I don't get to, to see the code as well. So because I can't check if the code really aligns with what the authors say in the paper. This is something that I regularly do. And um, I personally just um, think that this is a very nice thing. You can learn a lot from other authors, but it's also nice to encourage them to also publish the code. And finally, um, ask yourself, what are simple things that I can make publicly available? So if you're already um, doing a little project work or um, you're doing a PhD, um, think about what are things that are easy to make openly available, right? We don't have to start with the most difficult part. Let's start with the simple parts. And um, next slide, please. And yeah, so really ask yourself, what is it that I can personally do that is easy? An easy first step. Okay, let's go on. Next slide. 
Um, and I want to talk about some options here because um, it's always good to know your options and to see what um, do other people do that is potentially easy. And I want to, these are just some examples. There are other things that you can do as well, but these are examples that I think um, are sometimes easy. Not all the time, so data is often a very complicated uh, topic, for example, but um, yeah, these can be potential first steps. Um, next slide, please. So um, the first step that I can recommend is publishing preprint. And there I want to answer like to the uh, comment that open access um, is sometimes difficult because A, it costs a lot um, very often, and B, it's um, sometimes not the target the target journal that you want to publish in is not um, is not an open access journal, but you still want to publish there because it's like the journal that fits the best to the paper that you're writing. Okay, and um, these are two very valuable and important points. Um, and for both of these points, my answer is preprints. What is a preprint? A preprint is a um, the version of your paper that you have at the time of submission to the journal. So when you submit a journal for review, it's practically, in your opinion, it's done, right? So of course it goes back and forth between the reviewers and you, but um, at this point in time, you can potentially even already publish it. And um, this preprint can be published on a preprint server such as, for example, Archive. And I know that Archive is the, the standard in physics, for example. There's other preprint servers like the Open Science Framework, which is a more like general preprint server, or for example, BioArchive, MedArchive, for the different fields um, that are out there. And this is really something very simple. It's essentially a website that hosts PDF files, right? And you can upload your PDF file with your paper to these preprint servers and make sure that this will be in the end linked to the finally published paper in a journal. And this way people will have a version of the paper that they can actually access um, for, for free and it's online without any burdens. And almost, really almost all the publishers allow um, preprints. So even if they're like a very conservative closed access journal, they will usually allow preprints. If you're not sure about it, there's a website that's called um, Alfa Romeo. No, Sher sorry, Sherpa Romeo. I will post a link later in the chat if you're interested or in the, in the pad um, because that's really something um, that's very helpful. Uh, it's just a website that tells you which journals allow preprints and which don't, but almost all of them do. Next slide, please. Uh, the next thing that we can think about doing is verifying our data. What does that mean? So um, when we think about open data, for example, right, um, then that means we make data openly available online. But when we're talking about verifying data, we're being more specific. So FAIR is an acronym that stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So what does that actually mean? Findable means that we can find it on the internet, right? So if I enter um, some search terms into, into a search engine, for example, I can find the data set. Or um, it's on an a open data platform that's known, or it's linked in the paper. So it's findable on the internet. It's also accessible, so that's what the A stands for. For example, it, that means that you can actually go to this website and download the data. And it's also a unique data set um, and it's clear which data set is meant in which um, situation. This is why in this little image it says DOI. That's a unique identifier for a data set. Interoperable means that you can actually use it on any computer or on most computers at least. So for example, um, I personally, I don't have an Excel license. So Excel files are sometimes not so easy for me to handle, but CSV files, they work on any computer, right? So this is something that's interoperable. Reusable means that you actually are allowed to reuse it. Um, their licenses play a, an important role. So I, for example, use for all of 
uh, my work or wherever I'm allowed to do, I use a CC BY license. So this is just a license that allows others to reuse my work. Um, just the only thing that I ask them to do is um, saying that they've got it from me. For example, the slide deck is also licensed under CC BY. Um, FAIR data is not the same as open data, so data can potentially be FAIR but not open. So for example, I work a lot with um, medical data. This is not always possible to make that openly available on the internet. But I can, for example, make metadata available openly on the internet and tell people how they could potentially apply it to use the data. And there's a clear process how this works. And this data can also be called FAIR. Um, next slide, please. Um, if I um, want to make my data openly available online, then there's a lot of different platforms that I can use. Um, I'm just naming a few here. So open trials is not maybe not the thing that you, <laughs> you work with in your field, but you may have heard of uh, Zenodo because that's a platform that was um, started by uh, CERN, for example. And um, another platform is the Open Science Framework, which is a very general um, platform for both data, code, also preprints, and so on. Um, I think for your field, probably Synodo is the go-to. Or maybe you have an even more um, topic-specific online platform for your data. Um, or maybe even your institution has a data platform. So this is something that I can recommend. I usually recommend um, things here that are not commercial. So um, n none of these examples that are shown here are commercial. They're all like from the community for the community um, and nonprofit. For example, Figshare is something that I don't recommend because um, this is commercial and I don't know what their commercial interest is in my work. and. Um, this is something that I don't feel comfortable with, personally. Uh, next slide, please. So why don't we just give it a try? So we can, for example, see Synodo or also the Open Science Framework, so short OSF, and just try uploading something. It's really not so hard. Um, so if you have, like, for example, a poster that you've presented at a conference or at some other event, why don't you try uploading it to the Open Science Framework and see how it goes? Just as a first try to see how it works and that it's actually pretty easy. And next time when you really need it and you want to share your whole research project, for example, then you'll already know how it works. Next slide. Okay, let's uh, talk about code. So with code, it's actually really very similar than as with data. We uh, upload it to some, some platform. Um, the platforms might be a little different, but it can also be the Open Science Framework or Sonodo um, as in these examples before. But there's a couple of things that I personally would do before I upload data. And, uh, before I upload code. And um, here I want to answer to the, this question as well about like, yeah, the thing is why people are scared um, to make their, their code openly available is because it's like you always feel like the code is not good enough for others to see. Well, I can already tell you that, so I've been using R and I've been programming since like 2009, and I've, I'm doing it pretty regularly. I've published a couple of R packages. So I would say I'm like, yeah, probably pretty good, but I st still feel embarrassed about it, right? And so um, I can already say it probably will, ne will never go away, no matter how good your code is. So um, just like do it regardless. <laughs> Um, a couple of things that help with that. Um, I think that's the first point here is probably not su such a big topic in your field, but um, step one is obviously using code, right? So using scripts instead of clicking programs such as like SPSS, for example, or um, using R or Python instead of Excel, um, for example. Um, the second step is like start with easy things again. Start with 
giving good names to your files and folders, as well as to your variables in your scripts. So these are pretty easy things and like non-technical, but personally, I think they're some of the most valuable um, things that I do to make my work such that I still understand it in five years, and also obviously so that others understand it as well. The next step is documenting. Um, just having a line above complex um, code that just says what the code is about. Let it be five lines sometimes, right? Just say what the code below is going to do. And then finally, um, even if you're not comfortable with it, even if you like think, well, this code is so ugly, still do just publish it. It's better than having the code, but the better than not publishing the code. Um, publishing ag ugly code is something that everyone does, um, and <laughs> nobody feels like their code is beautiful, right? Um, <laughs> so it's something that we have to go through. It's the same as like if you record yourself, you will always think that the things that you say sound really awkward. It's the same with publishing code. Um, yeah, uh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, this is a very good point um, that is very strongly connected with um, code publishing is using version control. And I don't know how common version control is in your field yet, but I personally, when I work with code or any other text-based things, <laughs> even when I write papers, I use version control. What does version control actually mean? So in the olden days, what did we do? So actually this here at the top is a, is a screenshot from an actual email that I received. It says, Dear colleagues, attached you find the public version of the <laughs> protocol. Please have a look and do comment. We can also meet to aggregate our reviews. And then in the attachment we find um, a study proposal, um, version one from this and that date, right? And now imagine that actually this email was sent out to 10 people, and now 10 people commented and sent it back. And there's lots of different versions coming back to the poor email sender, right? And this poor person needs to aggregate all the results um, into one single document in the end. And this is something that is super painful, right? Um, nobody wants to be the person who has to do that. Um, what we see a lot in... In, yeah, for people who don't really use like standard version control, so automated computer version control, but like do it using their naming of files, which we see both in the email on, and here in the screenshot on the top left, is something where we just say what the version name is of the file, right, in, in the name um, of the file. So here we see paper draft, and then we see paper update, and then we see paper final. And then we're like, yes, this is the fam final paper. And then, of course, we give it uh, to our supervisor, and the supervisor says, well, but you have to change these things. And then you go back, and then it's final too. And then this happens over and over again until we're, like, frustrated to a point where we're like, oh, I can't do this anymore. But good news, we don't have to do it this way. Um, there is a standardized way of um, doing this automatically using our computers. And uh, the solution, or one of the famous solutions, is called Git. So if you don't know Git yet, I really recommend learning it. Um, I personally wouldn't want to live without it anymore. So it's that important to me. Um, so this is one thing that I can really recommend as one of the steps towards becoming an open uh, yeah, scientist, but also if you work in any other field where you use code. Uh, next slide, please. Pre-registration is something um, that's still pretty new, but I think it's really powerful. Um, so pre-registration means that you say what you're going to do in a project before you actually start the project. And uh, you can even write what we call registered reports. And that just essentially means you're writing the paper that you're going to write anyhow um, before you actually start collecting the data even. 
right? You're writing all the things except for, well, the results part, because obviously that you don't have. But you write down what your methods are going to be. You write down how you're going to collect the data, how you're going to do the whole research project. And this can be reviewed as a so-called registered report. And the cool thing is, if this registered report gets through peer review and gets accepted, then your paper will be automatically accepted in the end if you stick to the things that you said that you would do. And this is obviously really cool, especially for us young researchers, because if we start a project and this is uh, really cool and the reviewers like it, then we'll go through with it um, and know that it's going to be exec accepted no matter what the results are going to be, um, which is not always the case, obviously. So sometimes the results are not very interesting, but the project was well designed and everything was well done, um, but it still doesn't get accepted. Um, on the other hand, if the reviewers already think it's a bad idea and your project is not um, useful, then you'll know early on before you put too much work into it. Okay, next slide. Yeah, so this is already, I'm coming to the end now so that we can also have still some time for discussions. Um, science communication is like one of the, like, when you've done all of the other steps, or even if you if you don't do the other steps, but um, just talking about your science also makes it more open, obviously. So if you are, for example, on Twitter and talk about your science and say, like, um, talk about also your struggles, then this makes you not only more appro approachable and more widely known, but it also, um, yeah, makes your science more accessible as well. Um, I am for example, very active on Twitter. Um, I'm also trying to give a lot of talks about my research. I'm thinking about even starting a podcast. This is something that maybe will happen next year. And I'm really excited also if the media picks up my work, which we see here at the top, uh, at the bottom. Um, in this case, I would have wished that the author <laughs> of the article would have talked to me as well, because then I could have helped a little bit and make it even better. But um, this is something where I think, yeah, we, we can also do more open science and more accessible science by talking about it. And next slide. Before we finish up here with me talking and getting to your questions, I want to leave you with a few additional tips. Um, so as I said in the beginning, talk to other people, talk to other aspiring science champions or people that you consider science champions about open science and see what they're doing. Um, if you ever should um, run into like a really an issue where someone, where you feel like someone is doing science wrong or um, unethical and you need someone who helps you with figuring out this problem, most research institutions have someone who's called an ombudsperson um, who has specifically the responsibility to help in these scenarios where really fraud is happening or something unethical is going on. And finally, I want to uh, leave a book recommendation. Um, the book is called Science Fictions, and I think it was a very enjoyable read. If you are interested in this topic and want to learn more, I think this is an easy place to start. Uh, there's also an audiobook available, which I personally really enjoyed. And then we come to the final slide um, where I want to leave you with um, the hope that you will connect with me um, maybe on Twitter. And then I will try to see if we have any questions or anything that you would like to discuss about um, uh, yeah, on the on the topics on my talk, and I already see that there's one question. I I would just read it out, right? Is that okay? And then try to answer. Yeah, sure. Okay. So the question is: When you say that you ask for open resources, do you mean you contact the researchers of a paper, for example, and what is their usual re reaction? Are they helpful and glad to help? Do you think this has uh, have changed due to your background or the institution you were working for? Um, I think this is a very cool question. Um, 
So when I said I ask for open resources, um, I often do that in the role of a reviewer. So then I usually contact the editor who has given the, the paper to me to review it, and then I say, well, I, I need code to be able to review this, and then they get in touch with the author. So I don't really know what their actual reaction is, but most of the time I do get the code. So um, the authors do want to get their paper accepted to, to the journal, and they, then it's uh, usually um, not, not a big deal. Um, I've had other situations as well where I was interested in the work that others did and just contacted them, and their the reactions are, to be honest, they're mixed. Um, sometimes they say, well, I don't have access to the code anymore. I switched institutions, and um, I have no idea where, where it is. Um, so this is something concerning, like, yeah, the organization, uh, level of organization of individual researchers. And it, I, I can say from, from myself, this is a, an important problem that we have is like the switching of institutions and not being, bringing everything with us um, will eventually lead to these kinds of issues if we don't have them under version control or whatever. Um, so yeah, there's mixed, mixed reactions to it. Um, sometimes people will just send it to you. Sometimes people say they can't. Sometimes people say different things. So very, very, very different. I'm not sure I can say something about whether it's different depending on my institution. Um, that is very hard for me to say because I don't know what it is like to be a different person. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I wonder if anyone here maybe has different experiences that they want to share on this. <clears throat> So, so um, I, it never happened to me actually, but I, I want to maybe ask a related question. Mm -hmm. So, um, suppose that you have access to the data of an article, for example, that you, you even have access to the code and you try to reproduce the analysis and whatever you do, you are not capable of getting to the same results, you get very different results. So you ask for the code and you are not getting um, any, any useful answers or basically, or even or you're even getting a negative answer. Do you, do you think you should feel an obligation of uh, raising an alarm or of, of some kind to institution of, or where the, the, the scientist who is not sharing the, day, the code is working? Or do you think that that's, uh, that's a complicated situation that you, I mean, how, how, how would you react to that? What, what, what would you do, basically, in that situation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I personally wouldn't like, um, go that far, to be honest. So I would be disappointed and um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I would just probably be, be disappointed for myself, but I wouldn't like go to someone and say, well, this is unacceptable, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's different if I'm a reviewer, then I can say, well, this is unacceptable. I will reject, right? If I'm also working for a journal as, a, as an editor, and there I will also say, well, this is unacceptable for our journal because we, this is a standard that we hold ourselves to, and um, I will reject the paper. This, obviously, I can't do in, when I have different hats on, right? Um, I also see someone who's writing that they contacted uh, a researcher from Harvard asking for some help twice uh, on one of the, their papers, zero responses, not even a no. Um, so maybe the background in institution helps. So I can definitely say that I've had a couple of situations where I tried to write emails to people and I didn't get a single response. Um, so this is, yeah, I don't know. Maybe the institution helps. Maybe it's just normal that researchers are, are busy and they don't want to deal with things that that are like research, that's like research of the past and people just want to steer up um, things that we don't want to talk about anymore. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's very hard to say, um, but it is definitely frustrating. Um, then there's one more question um, asking, uh, do funding institutions have requirements regarding open science? Um, and uh, this is a very good question because this is more and more becoming um, the case. So I don't know how it is for you or for, for the funding bodies in your country, but uh, definitely 
I can say for European Union funding, um, open science is becoming a requirement. It's not, um, it's not as strict yet um, as many, many would hope, but it's definitely becoming more and more of a requirement, and actually you have to give some money back if you don't do it. Um, so this is really something that's not just like a nice thing to have anymore for some of the funders, but it's really obligatory. Um, in Germany, for the German research funder, it's usually not obligatory yet, but I know that they're internally also talking about this, um, making this more required. Um, I hope this is answering the question. I don't know if anyone knows about um, research funders um, in your country. No, uh, we don't. There is no. We don't have to uh, share anything. Okay. Um, yeah. So that's that's uh, that's not so cool. What we do, for example, in the lab is that we still share most of the data and code, and even in the journal also doesn't require that. And what, what we usually find is that the reviewers are uh, happy with that. Like we get the okay, congratulations for sharing the data. So I think that even mm -hmm. if you are not required by the journal or even by the funding institution to share the data. Um, many reviewers still uh, acknowledge that you are doing something right, and they're happy with that. So I think that that's uh, at least one good reason to do so, even if you are not really formally required. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, of course, then again, of course, the reason, as you said it, well, you are also helping others and so on. So forth. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's becoming more and more a thing that actually helps you with your career. I'm also seeing this for myself, like, so my work is so focused on open science and reproducible research, so it's more like I've become like a meta-researcher doing research about the way we do the research, and I see that there's a lot of interest in this, and I see that by like the number of invitations I get to talk, but also like um, I'm still pretty young, so I'm 30 years old, and I'm already leading a research group, which is um, I think personally pretty cool, um, to be honest, that they accepted me for the position that I have now. Um, and so I see that other people think that this is an important topic and this is a topic of the future. So um, this may obviously be different in different countries and uh, in different institutions. There's also big things that I think we need to change in, in the institution that I work in. But... Uh, I mean, we're, we're taking slow steps, right? As I said, uh, as an individual, we're, we can take some small steps that are easy in the right direction. And this also obviously holds for institutions or countries. Um, we just need to take small steps in the right direction, and eventually we'll, be, we'll have a better scientific um, field than we used to have when we talked about the reproducibility crisis. So I see... Here in the pad, there's a very long question, so I'll read that out to everyone uh, and hope that I can say something about that as well. So the question is, um, or like, let's say, I don't know if it's a question yet. <laughs> um, so the person's writing, I want to share my experience and opinion and would like to know your view about it. I worked in free software slash open source field in the past. Now, in physics, I work on projects on instrumentation with open hardware. For example, I've made some instruments for labs based on programmable hardware and open the code in GitHub. The problem is most of the people interested in the designed device sometimes need small changes on the code, but they don't have the software architecture. Sometimes they don't understand all the programming languages used in the project to make changes themselves. What happens in the end is they ask me to compile the code version with small changes. In my opinion, the only way to make the shared code slash information slash et cetera really public is to have a community cooperating and working behind. It is not just to share code and info, it's also sharing common view and work, procedures and things need to understand each other and cooperate. Without community, it is hard to share. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Well, this is a very, very interesting um, comment and a very interesting situation and something where I do, I do definitely <laughs> have an opinion about. And I think it's pretty cool what you're doing, actually. And I completely agree with your view that if you have projects like um, 
like software packages that are used by others, um, it's sometimes a burden as well. So you're probably happy when the first few people are using your package and maybe even opening issues, but at some point it becomes a burden and it stops you from doing new, new work, right? And this is something where um, I completely agree it's good or better to have a community who works on this. And building communities is obviously not easy, and this is something where... I can, from, from my own perspective and my own experience, say this is something that is one of the hardest things um, when we talk about open source software, especially in the scientific context, right? Because this is not a paper. This is not as valued as a paper, and especially if this is something that's already out there and already being used, and it's not something new. Um, and so what I uh, want to say there is that there is um, a new movement forming that has started in the UK a couple of years ago and has led to tremendous changes already in the um, in UK's um, way of doing science, and it's called um, RSE, which is short for Research Software Engineers. And these research software engineers, um, what they're asking for is that um, code is more valued, and this that we also think about these things like long-term maintenance of software projects, that we have specific careers for people who actually want to do that or who want to build communities about uh, around their software project. And this is something that I definitely, for the person who wrote this, um, is something that I really recommend you to look into is like the RSE community. There's like um, an international growing community um, out there. I don't know what it is like in your country if, if there's like a national group already. In Germany, this has started only, we had the first conference like last year. So this is all pretty new. So maybe you might be the, <laughs> the one who kicks that off in your region or country. Um, but this is definitely something where I would say get together with other people and um, try to like make this more seen that this is a real issue that we have in science because we depend so much on on the software, right, in science and in physics especially. And we need to value people who write scientific software um, and, yeah, help them, help them to do it and grow a community around it. I hope that um, answered your question at least a little bit or m gave you hope. So I do have hope. Um, because, like, this is a big move movement and there's lots of people involved. And um, there's even currently, I'm, I'm not sure if it's still going on, It's since we, we weren't able to do an, a conference this year because of the virus, we're, we went online and there's, um, it's called the SORSE um, event series um, that you can watch online. And I'm sure all the videos about it are available, I think, on YouTube. Um, so I'll write it in the pad. So it's called Zorz. Oh, my internet is gone again. Okay, but um, yeah, maybe you can find it and, and post it somewhere to, to share with the rest. Okay, well, um, I think that, that, that was really great, Haley. Um, I really would like to thank you for your talk. It was really Interesting, and I think that, that you have brought into attention some, some very important things that were, are, are really an issue yet in our community, uh, at least in the, physics, in the physics community, where this really uh, isn't really something that's really the mainstream yet. So, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought these things to our attention, and I, I think that many of us will, will change that. We talk that really will have a, an impact in the way we, we, some of us at least, behave and share and communicate our science. So I'm, I'm really thankful for that um, to you. Well, for thank you. It was a pleasure. And I hope you still have a great uh, winter school and learn a lot from all the other speakers as well. And, yeah, if you have any questions or any doubts or anything else, um, please be, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, bueno, eh, tenemos eh, función continuada porque ya está Luis. Hola Luis, ¿estás con